All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to our session today, Leveraging Engagement Strategies and Social Interactions to Foster Community. It is a workshop slash conversation that uh, my colleagues uh, and I thought long and hard about you know how to how to offer this because it, the concept uh, and the content area is so so important for for instruction period, but especially for online instruction. However, some of these uh, tools that we're talking about can also be used even if you have a face to face setting and most of us are planning on returning to face-to-face -to -face, uh, environments in the fall, we could still use the uh, online environment to support our development of, of a community. So I'd like uh, my two colleagues to present themselves. So introduce, starting with Yvonne. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Yvonne Johnson, and I'm the Multimodal Teaching Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. And I, I work with faculty who teach face-to-face -face online, um, supporting their pedagogy and technology. And I also teach research courses for um, health, the College of Health and Human Sciences. Thank you for Mike. joining us today. Thank you. Mike? Hi, everybody. This is Mike Taylor. Uh, I'm an instructional support specialist at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. And uh, I work with faculty on a lot of different uh, technology stuff with Blackboard and um, other online tools. So uh, I'm, I may have worked with one of you if you've ever contacted our department. Uh, so hopefully you have a good time today and uh, ask some questions because that's really, this is kind of an open forum. So we want to have a lot of back and forth today. All right, thanks. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> and I'm Dan Cabrera, the Multimedia Coordinator. Um, I also teach at the College of Health and Human Sciences, mostly ethics uh, courses and all exclusively online. All right. So in the chat area, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Um, I think we've already asked a couple who were in here early on. Um, if they would just uh, provide their name and their department, um, and any questions about uh, about engagement, uh, how, what you use to engage with your class and develop that sense of community. While you're thinking about it, I'm actually having a question here. It's not a rhetorical question. It's an actual question. Why is it important to develop or to foster community? All right. So you can use your microphone if you want to chime in on that. I mean, it's, it's a real question. Um, I have my own take on it, um, um, but I'd like to see what you guys have in mind for the importance of fostering community. So Alexa, Bill, Don, if you want to... Okay, I'll talk. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is you get ideas you might not think of yourself. So it's, you know, to talk with other people about a certain issue is gives you new perspective so you can consider them. That's a great, uh, a great reason to, to, to foster that, uh, that sense of community. Getting input from, from different folks and actually building connections with them. So Don says to promote a sense of belonging and encouragement to learn. Yes, that mm -hmm. sense of belonging is so important. We all seek uh, a, a sort of sense of, of belonging. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, Alexa, for students to connect with each other and to feel more comfortably in their learning environment. Absolutely. So um, oh, we're all coming in here. Great, great. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, great. So uh, according to Flower Darby and Jim Lang uh, with uh, Small Teaching Online, this is the book that they published in 2018. When we facilitate the development of a robust and dynamic community of learners in an online class, we significantly increase the potential for individual learning, student learning, and success. The flip side of that is when we don't attend to this essential ingredient, we see high rates of attrition, low engagement, and minimal participation. And that's kind of a frightening, uh, a frightening thought. We, we don't want to lose connection with our students. And to have that sense that we're all in this together that we all have a common uh, series of, of goals. Um, we all want to help each other do well. That's really, really important. And so to that end, I'm going to be defining some, uh, 
some of these terms engagement social interaction and community and so um student engagement has been defined as involving students in meaningful academic activities the teacher's role is to help students engage and interact with the course uh, content so that students can create their own knowledge so it isn't simply pro giving stuff out it's having the students work with that material to be able to use it to create new new information um, it's kind of a construction a constructivist approach to to instruction now social interaction it plays an important role in learning interacting with other people has proven to be quite effective in assisting the learner to organize his thoughts reflect their understanding and find gaps in their reasoning uh, underneath the broad umbrella of social interactions and learning variants can range from peer learning reciprocal teaching learning by teaching learning by observation learning by doing and self other uh, monitoring having uh, having some sense of, of back and forth you're not doing it by yourself now these areas overlap in scholarship and are often an optimal way to help students learn different forms of collaborative learning can create ideal circumstances when examining the impact of social interaction on learning and so today i'm going to be presenting some some examples that i use but i'm going to be asking you how you do it how you get your students to to interact uh socially uh within the context of the course uh, and 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 uh, sort of by definition engage with the course content so ideally you want them to engage with the content with with the uh with you as the instructor and also with each other uh, almost more importantly than, than that now feeling a sense of community and belonging to a group has been shown to be positively associated with students motivation with their persistence and their academic self-efficacy so a sense of community is really integral across educational formats and can achieve achievement interactivity and retention now in, in countless student focus groups conducted over nearly 20 years students have consistently maintained that even if they thought about dropping out a relationship with someone else on campus and that could be an instructor a staff member or even another student gave them the encouragement guidance or support they needed to keep going so the need for this connection has grown exponentially in the past year. So here are some, some quick ideas on how to leverage the engagement and how to foster that community. Uh, student, and the instructor, the teacher, the professor could be focusing and directing discussions. So having a structured activity or a series of structured activities where the students are not sort of in the dark about how to proceed, giving them clear instructions, giving them an idea of what the objective for a particular activity, learning activity is, and even what, uh, what the objective uh, of, of a, an assessment would be as well. Also, you want to encourage open expression of opinions. You want to have them respond to communications. Uh, you, as the instructor, should be responding to communications and feedback in a timely way. So that timely, uh, it, it, it means that you're responding pretty quickly after they've submitted. So it might be a question that they ask in class, or it might be some um, uh, an assignment that they've submitted. Uh, maybe it's a discussion board assignment. Um, and then you want to respond to them very quickly. And, it, and it's, it's not just in a timely way. It should be significant feedback. It shouldn't be very nice, nice job. That doesn't really provide them adequate information. It, it should be a little bit more significant than that. You also want to give them opportunities to build relationships. How do you do that? How do you give them opportunities, especially if it's an online environment? Well, there are two primary venues for doing that in, in, in an online environment, but both of them require the same thing, which is for you as the instructor to be actively present uh, as much as possible. So let's look at the, the two uh, possible uh, ways of doing this is synch synchronous versus asynchronous teaching uh, or learning. So synchronous learning refers to uh, a learning event in which a group of participants is engaged in learning at the same time. With synchronous learning, participants can receive immediate feedback. So what just as we're here in this session right now with you, uh, all six of us, or now I guess it's uh, it's eight of us, um, we. Uh, I can ask you a question. You can ask me a question. We can answer each other's questions back and forth, but it's in real time. Uh, so the instructor, the learner, and the uh, participants uh, 
uh, have to be in in, um, in this session at the same time to provide immediate feedback. However, with asynchronous learning, the participants can learn at their own pace, which which is fine. You know, they, they can listen to something, they can watch, they can read or whatever. Now, the instructor, the learner, and the other participants are not engaged in the learning process at the same time. So there's no real time interaction with the instructor or other students. So I might ask you, what are the benefits of synchronous learning? Okay, so Al, uh, Alexa, Bill, Don, Nahal, Robert, I'd like you to think about what might be some advantages of uh, of synchronous uh, teaching at the same time. Bill, I see your microphone is on. Do you have a? Do yeah, you have a I can talk. I can talk. I, I'm just leaving leaving it on now, so I don't oh, okay. talk without communicating at all with anyone. Um, uh, one thing is possible that uh, you, you can back and forth, you know, you can have argument and counter argument or information in addition to information given, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it happens right away. Yes, as a matter of fact, people can respond spontaneously. I mean, I, I think as a, a benefit, absolutely, it's very difficult to beat that. However, and, uh, a benefit of asynchronous is that people like you as the instructor might pose a question in the discussion board forum and then ask students to think about it. And they have the benefit of some time to reflect on it, maybe they even seek out some information to support their, their, uh, their approach uh, or their, their answers, and they can use that. So there are benefits to both. Don says the benefit of, of synchronous uh, teaching is, is, or learning is consistent exposure to content and interaction with classmates and the instructor. Yes, in fact, yes content interaction with classmates and the instructor, which is ideally what should happen. You want to make sure that we're all connected. Alexa says synchronous uh, uh, learning is beneficial for immediate interaction for students who may have questions to, uh, and to also ask follow-up questions and the more real social interaction that takes place. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. Now, I want, to, I want to sort of emphasize that both types of, of learning, synchronous and asynchronous, have their place in online uh, inter, uh, instruction. Let's see. Yes, Nahal says, more sense of belonging. So, Nahal, you just shared something with me like this. Now, we're all, on, we're all sort of in, in a certain uh, uh, vibe. We all have a similar uh, a sense of, of how we want to respond to, to these types of questions. Okay. Now, ideally, students should be able to experience personal learning interactions and, and interpersonal communications uh, throughout not just a class period, but throughout their entire academic or college career, um, as well as an exposure of a good mix of learning activities and the range in, in, uh, uh, in range of assessment types, including verbal and written assignments opportunities to ensure that instruction is meeting a quality standard. Okay. So here's some examples that I have of social interactions to foster community. Uh, right now, what we're doing, we're using this web conferencing platform. We're using uh, uh, Collaborate. Uh, we probably all in the past year have used uh, a number of other ones as well. I'm not sure if you've, if you've used Zoom, uh, but we've become big users of Zoom as, as well as Microsoft Teams. And they pretty much uh, offer a very similar set of uh, features. Um, and so, Yes, you know, I, I've asked you questions, you've answered your questions, I've asked if you've had any questions of me. So that's something which is great, that, that fosters the, the sense of community, as I was just saying, because we're engaged in social interaction, we're, we're also engaged, uh, period. And so another way of using it, in fact, it, it's part of the, the feature set of, of Collaborate, um, is the use of breakout uh, groups. And so right here is, I have an, I have an example of, of a breakout group, you know, here, you know, or um, this is, of course, it's just something that I've done in the past. I've been a screen capture. I have uh, four members in the main room. We've got two. I have uh, group one and group two, and we can see that that uh, they are um, they are populated. I've already moved them to. I'm getting ready to move them to to a group or to another group. I can make changes and all that stuff. And you can see at later on, I have zero members. In the main room, or what we're in right now, in collaborate is the main room. But I have four uh, members of the session in group one, four members in group and group two, and I might be separating people to ask them to to engage in a certain type of activity. Maybe with solving a problem, uh, uh, maybe it's coming up with new materials, new content, or sharing some ideas, 
or responding to a question prompt that I'd given them. Okay. Uh, and so those are examples of, of synchronous th things that are done in real time, things uh, where people can, can interact with each other. Let's see. Um, however, there's also asynchronous, and, and I'm not going to say that one is, is absolutely better than the other. Certainly, you want to have a mix of, of the two types of instruction, uh, but you don't want to really just leave it to, to one or the other. I mean, there, there are probably going to be some, some limitations. However, one of the benefits of the um, uh, web conferencing tool that we're using is that in addition to doing it in real time, I can also record it. So later on, people can go back and they can they can review this uh, this presentation. So in case they've missed something or they want to go back and they wanted to repeat something, or maybe it, uh, maybe someone had signed up for the workshop and wasn't able to attend, they can still experience that. So it's, it has the advantage of both being synchronous and asynchronous. But an entirely asynchronous approach would uh, be using tools like um, Yellowdig. Uh, now Yellowdig is a discussion platform. Uh, similar to discussion board, uh, but it does. But it, I think it, it it actually goes a step above and beyond a, a conventional or traditional discussion board because it connects learners, and it really empowers you as the instructor. Yellowdig boards, and that's what this thing is uh, on this left-hand side. It really creates a private network where learning communities can be established, and it allows discussion and sharing to foster the relationship, the skills, and knowledge that people that allow people uh, how to uh, how to thrive. Um, I, I, this is just taken uh, from a recent event that we had, the online teaching symposium, where uh, I had posed people and asking them after spending a day in the, in, in the session, what were takeaways they had from the various sessions that we had conducted? And so I would present my own and I would ask people to share their own. So people could share their own. They could respond to mine or anybody else's. They can even leave uh, sort of response emojis, uh, thumbs up or whatever it happens to be. Um, and uh, a lot of activity goes on in there. In fact, it was almost <laughs> it was almost out of control. There was so much sharing that I couldn't keep up with. Because with, I like to respond to everyone's uh, posting. Uh, there was just a lot of people doing it, and sometimes it was more than I could, I could handle. But that's a price that I was happy to pay. Another example of asynchronous is the use of Flipgrid. And, and Flipgrid, I've, I've been using that for, uh, for a number of years. It's a simple, free, and accessible video discussion experience for learners uh, and um, in, in classes where you can start a discussion and engage your, your community. So what I did, and in, uh, in, in fact, I, I would literally refer to my, uh, my course, my class, as a community. And, and this was an activity I had them do as introduce yourself to our community. So I have a recording of myself telling them, explaining them what to do. And right here, you can see that I've got my students here. Of course, it's kind of hard to see, which is, which is intentional. I didn't want you to see uh, individual or protect their, their privacy. But each one has a recording that they've left. In addition, I've asked if you, uh, if you have something that you recorded, I want you to listen to somebody else's recording and respond to them as well. So right off from the very beginning, the expectation is that we have a community and we want to we want to encourage people to participate in that community and that we want to be able to help each other as well. And finally, I have a uh, another example of a asynchronous tool that I use to foster community. In this case right here, this is a team case study analysis assignment where I have students who are part of a group project to be able to report uh, their, their status uh, for that week. And so for the last week, four weeks of the semester, I have both, uh, whether I have two people in a group or three or four, I have all of them present. I have one person who is the primary uh, uh, reporter for that week, and that role rotates from week to week. But I also have the other members who, who uh, also respond to their, uh, uh, their colleague, their, the status reporter for that week, on what they say. And it could be that says, yes, you know, what they said is, is absolutely true but they forgot to say such and such. So it's an opportunity to, to, uh, to share that. And they can do it either with a video, an audio, or they can use text to be able to share that information with them. So I can go in and I, and I can listen. One of the nice things about something like this is I could actually have a uh, record a, a lecture and then I have my students ask questions, which I can go back to because this is, this is done all asynchronously. And I can go back and I, and I can respond to the questions and it will automatically send them an email saying, hey, your, your question that you asked in that presentation 
was asked and, and, and responded to by the instructor. So there's a lot of interaction, uh, a lot of engagement with students. Okay. Uh, do any of you have any questions about we've, what we just covered? You can raise your hand, you can post in the, um, in the chat area. Uh, what is it uh, really like? Uh, what you really, oh, so Nahal says, what I really like about asynchronous methods is that it's respectful of one's own learning pace. Absolutely. And you want to make sure that that's, that's also a possibility because it may be that some, some folks learn at a different, uh, a different uh, pace, as Nahal says. And sometimes it, it, uh, it'll be helpful for them to be able to go back over material multiple times. Other people can just listen to material one time and they can proceed uh, without having to, to repeat like that. So we all, we're all different in terms of our, uh, of our ways of learning and, and how fast we learn and, and, and what is the best method for us. Thank you, Naha. Okay. So I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Yvonne, to step in here now. Thank you, Dan. And now we're going to move to talking about care and support for students and how that connects with building community in your classes. And I'm going to be talking about pedagogy of care, the course welcome and wellness and provide some examples and ask for you all to share some examples of how you address pedagogy of care and how you welcome students and, and respect students in the learning environment. And Nahal asked a question that and brought up a comment that was a perfect lead-in to this pedagogy of care and that she was saying that the asynchronous method re is respectful of the student's individual learning pace and that, and that definitely connects with the um, respect aspect of ped pedagogy of care. So thank you Nahal for sharing that. I'm going to share a little bit about the background of pedagogy of care. There's increasing research that shows that demonstrating empathy and concern for students and in the classroom is really important. And as we all know, during the pandemic, it was even more important because people had additional stresses and a lot higher levels of stress. And so the need for care, support, and respect for students, faculty, and just people in general was um, increased quite a bit. And the research shows that when faculty demonstrate respect for students and for their well-being, that students feel more motivated to engage in the course. They feel like the faculty member cares about them. They exhibit, um, they produce higher levels of quality of work. Um, and they're more likely to engage in office hours. And um, sometimes we, we have challenges with um, having students participate in office hours. And, and if you build that connection and that basis of respect and care, that can help students feel more comfortable engaging with you as a uh, faculty member. And one of the things that we saw during the pandemic, and it's, and it's um, present um, throughout the the regular um, school year as well, even when we're not in a pandemic, but it became exaggerated, was that, you know, students have a lot of responsibilities. And when we design a course and we conduct course activities and set deadlines, we should be cognizant of the responsibilities that students have. They might be caring for children or caring for their parents or other significant others, and they might have jobs and so they can't necessarily get online at a specific time and so setting up the the assignment deadlines and pacing the course that it, in a way that allows um, students to engage at times that fit their schedule um, shows respect for their um, them as as individuals and I work with students who are are full-time um, healthcare practitioners and some of them are taking two and three courses. They have very, very busy schedules and they like that courses are built ahead of time. They like that the deadlines are, are that, they, that they are notified of the deadlines far in advance and things like that because then they can build their, their schedules around it. And I've started to monitor students' engagement in the course 
more and when I started to see that a student may kind of have not been in the course for for a little while then I would send them an email and say hey you know what's going on I noticed that you haven't um, worked on this assignment you know is there do you have any questions is there anything I can do to help you and students responded um, positively to those contacts they thanked me and they said you know I was just really busy and I had you know something happened in their family and um, so it encouraged them to to engage in and produce the, the products and each student has significant unique situations and when we're creating a pedagogy of care we want to just make sure that we value their time and and respect it and make sure that when we set the deadlines they they are reasonable and I let students know that if they need extensions, um, you know, just contact me ahead of time and I'm happy to work with them. And um, in those conversations, you learn a lot more about students and, and the challenges and the demands on their time and, and what's going on in their individual lives and, and can really provide more support and, and respect and care for them. Um, and so thinking about what you all did, um, Bill, Alexa, Nahal, Robert, um, what did you all do during the pandemic or what do you do in your courses to demonstrate respect and support and care for students? Are there certain techniques that you use or certain contacts that you conduct with students? How do you do that to show them that you care and build community? And you could post in the chat or turn on your microphone. We have a small group, so either one's fine. Okay, Nahal, go ahead and turn on your microphone. Yes, hi again. Um, so what I did was um, I wanted to give my students this sense of um, I am I am in your side you know I understand that how these sudden changes from the face-to-face -face classes to online classes would be stressful increased anxiety um, so that I I just wanted to show them that I am there for them and some of the techniques that I did was I, I just decided to um, send send them some um, articles related to how to how to um, take care of your well-being how to take care of your mental health how to show your love to your loved ones um, a lot of YouTube videos a lot of uh, recent articles I, I just reassured them that I'm there for for them uh, if they have any questions technic technical wise um yeah that's terrific thank you nahal and <laughs> the another good thing about that is the you shared those resources and they they stay in the blackboard course and so the students can go back and access them and so they have your support throughout the whole semester that's terrific thank you and dawn says that um she had students send a message, send you a message on Teams with a picture of their favorite animal at the start of the semester and individually welcomed them there and chatted with them. And it also counted as participation assignment. That's terrific, Dawn, because that builds that connection and um, conversation and relationship with the students. And you're also showing respect for their time um, by counting it as a participation assignment. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Dawn. And Alexa says, um, Alexa tries to give very detailed feedback on Blackboard assignments and reply quickly to emails to show res that you respect their efforts and also try to encourage office hours and acknowledge the challenges of online learning. Yes, that's great. And when you're acknowledging the challenges of online learning, you're, sh you're showing empathy and you're showing that you recognize those challenges and, and that you're there to support them. And I worked with a professor this past semester and one of the things that professor did was set up 
times when students could contact her on Teams and they would have a 10 minute conversation. And that was another way to build those connections and to demonstrate care and respect for the students. Terrific, okay, thank you. Okay, and Bill, Bill provided information about the virus and safety activity illustrated charts. Okay, great. And where to get vaccinated, uh, the Sycamore Walgreens, and told them what you were doing as your, yourself as a model, and then allowed absences and makeup lessons when people were feeling under the weather. Yes, that's, that's terrific. So you're providing them resources so that they can stay well and some of those um, vaccination sites and things were kind of hard to to keep track of there um, when we first kind of got into the vaccination phase and so that's terrific when you had information you shared it with the students bill and um, yes allowed absences yes because we did have students who were um, having they either had COVID or they had um, symptoms from the, the vaccination, so that's terrific, showing respect and, and concern and support for them. Thank you. And some other things that, um, yes, yes, um, yeah, that's great, Bill, yes, of course, that you're thrilled that none of us got sick, yes, very good. And in terms of other techniques you could use to show that you're you know, trying to build community and, and fostering that support and care. You know, be responsive to students and um, several people had said that, you know, they respond, try to respond quickly to students and give significant um, feedback, detailed feedback. And Alexa had said that providing detailed feedback on the assignments was, was important. Knowing the names of your students and Dan had talked about um, building those introductions, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, in a little bit. So knowing the names shows that you value them as individuals, and calling them by name helps to build that community and shows respect for them. And asking students what, what can you do to, um, you know, help them? What kind of support do they need? Um, and, and they will, once you have those connections built and they, and they feel that, that you really can um, care for, care about them and that you've reached out to them, they're more likely to to engage with you and let you know what's really going on. And then you can really help them and, and work out some reasonable um, ways to, to help them be successful in your class. And the, the screen shows the first picture is a, um, an overview of the course and um, introduction. And I Welcome students to the course. I use Kaltura Capture, which is, a, um, I find it a very user-friendly tool. I use Kaltura Capture to record my course welcome. I recorded it in an informal place. I talked about um, myself, shared some information about my um, background. One of the things that, that I think about when I'm um, preparing to teach is, you know, when you walk into a face-to-face -face course, there you can walk around and talk to the students and, and things like that, and you can give them guidance about what to do. Well, when a student comes into an online course, they don't necessarily know what they're supposed to do, um, where they're supposed to go, and so I try to incorporate those things in the course welcome. Um, you know, I want to make sure that they see me, that they um, know that I'm there to support them and I also um, provide this information make sure that the course is open at least a week and sometimes a couple of weeks ahead of the semester because students want to kind of get a head start they want to make sure they get their books on time and those kinds of things and that's showing respect for them they have the busy schedules and also including a bit about yourself I I uh, have a picture of myself kayaking um, down the river, and so um, that shows students that, you know, your other interests, and then in response to that, they will share some other interests that helps to build the community and support, because then students will say, oh, you know, I kayak, or I read that book, or I mountain bike, or I play the guitar, or whatever, and it shows that you value them and respect them as individuals. Now, to ask 
you all, what, what kind of techniques do you use to, um, and I also use Flipgrid. Dan talked about Flipgrid, so I'm not going to go into that, but I also use Flipgrid for student introductions so that they can respond to each other and, and build connections. But what types of techniques do you all use um, to build that community and that support and respect among the students? Um, Bill, Nahal, Don, Alexa, Robert, um, you can turn on your microphone or text to provide some examples. Um, I'm sorry, would that be okay if I ask you to repeat your question? Yes, that's fine. Could you provide examples of how you welcome students to the course to show them that you, um, you know, to provide an overview of the course and show them that you um, are there to support and respect them? I can go first. Okay, thank you, Nahal. Um, so what I usually do, especially with my asynchronous classes, um, I usually create a discussion board question. It's not, not, not a question necessarily, but the title is usually, uh, the title that I put for that a specific discussion question is, let's, let us get connected and support one another. So, and then I ask students to, um, to, to introduce themselves, what are, what are some of their interests. Um, when we were during the pandemic, one of the questions was, um, uh, how, how, what, what is your experience living in quarantine? Those, those kind of questions. And um, um, I also, when it comes to students with disabilities, I also wanted to let them know that there are some sources, resources available for students with disabilities to, you know, give them this sense of belonging. Um, I didn't want anybody to feel behind. That's terrific. Thank you, Nahal. Yes, those are great examples of how you're showing respect and support and care for the students. And Dawn says that she used VoiceThread and had the students uh, respond in Spanish, um, what their names are, where they're from, their study. That's terrific. And Bill said he provides phone and email of all the students in the class for everyone and encourages them to give feedback on the musical performances. Yes, that's going to build that community and interaction. And Alexa says, as a TA uh, posted to the class discussion board with an introduction on who, who you are and what your role was, and let them know that you're there to um, as an uh, option for extra help. Yes, that's terrific. So that definitely, those techniques definitely build into that, providing support, respect, and building community. And then uh, the last thing that I'm just going to briefly talk about is that um, NIU was, I wanted to provide some wellness resources for the students. And during the pandemic, NIU was part of this, this wellness collaborative. And we could join it and, and we could follow different uh, routines. We could do aerobics, we could do yoga, we could do meditation. So I provided that information to the students and I also provided a the, the green leaves on the screen represent a, a meditation video I found on YouTube and students could follow that if they had um, a lot of stress. And so I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, if they wanted to do something independently that these resources were there for them as well. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Mike Taylor, to um, talk about the next slides. Hi, everybody. This is Mike. Um, yeah, so some other things that are kind of important in this space of discussion are our social interactions. So, you know, I think we all know our students aren't just students. They're individuals outside of the classroom. So um, some of the some of the things that might help students feel more engaged in in the classroom and in, in the university is just um, recognizing that they have interests that are, you know, outside of the outside of the school, outside of the classroom, 
and figuring out ways to connect those interests in a meaningful way in the classroom. Um, I was I was thinking of three kinds of uh, three three basic ideas here that we could talk a little bit about. Um, the first one is a little closer to the classroom, but it's it's called uh, uh, this, the idea of experiential learning. Um, I was involved with some of these projects uh, in my previous position, and I know the university is trying to to do this, but essentially these experiential learning projects were an opportunity to bring students from different departments together to work on some kind of project that uh, that interests them. So we would bring, you know, a lot of the projects revolved around building um, either some kind of technology, uh, a video game perhaps, a web, uh, some kind of website or a learning environment, and we would need to get from different disciplines to actually be able to produce this. So a, a num I think a number of people that have worked in my department here at the, at the Center for Innovative Teaching Learning actually were students and went through this experiential learning um, process back a few years ago. So so that's something, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, I, I'd recommend looking into experiential learning both as a concept and also how it's being done at NIU. I think that that's probably going to be really important as, as, the, as higher education evolves, that we're going to see the need for this because it, it's really closer to how students interact outside of school once they graduate, um, when they're working in teams. Um, they're not going to be surrounded so much by uh, people with the same backgrounds. They're going to be surrounded with people different backgrounds and need to communicate across disciplines and things like that. Um, the other one that's a little more straightforward is just um, professional organizations. Uh, I think this was something that I was encouraged to, to do when I was in college, uh, was to join or be somewhat re related to a professional organization in my field so that I could meet people outside of NIU and meet people um, that are old, you know, older, more more experienced in those those places. So, um, I think you're all probably familiar with professional organizations. So I won't belabor that. Uh, but if you want to ask questions about it, and the third one is uh, it says affinity groups, but actually the technical term that is affinity spaces. And I'm gonna put a link. This is just a Wikipedia article, but this will give you an introduction to the idea of affinity spaces. Um, I got this from um, a professor uh, named Jim Jim G or James Paul G. Um, he's he's been working uh, a lot with ideas around um, like he he was really uh, influential in looking at how video games can help with learning pedagogy. Um, not so much to build games that are learning environments, but looking at how games actually teach the players to progress through the game and seeing you know, a well-designed game has a lot in common with a well-designed course. So, uh, but this idea of affinity spaces is a little uh, different in, in it's kind of, uh, let's say a counterpart to the idea of community because an affinity space really isn't a community per se it's a it's a place where people can gather to uh, learn and teach about things that they're that they're interested in. So they they can, with the the ways that internet technology has changed, there's a lot of these affinity spaces coming online. Um, some of them are really great. Some of them can be kind of crazy because there's there's not a lot of structure in them, but but uh, when you find one that that is actually engaging, um, it, it you can meet people and learn very very uh, interesting things there. So, um, yeah, any anyone have any thoughts on any of these that they'd like to talk about? I'd like to hear your ideas on this or your experiences with with any of that.
tell them, Mike, this is Dan. Hi, Dan. I really like the idea of, of students getting involved with professional organizations before they, they graduate. I think it's important um, as an introduction. It's something which faculty can facilitate. Uh, for instance, in my own field of public health, uh, whenever I have uh, classes, I would encourage students to join the American uh, Public Health Association to get them sort of in the sense of, of uh, who are people that are important to be in the field that you need to know, um, or even uh, other students at the same uh, the same institution, because these people will, when they go out into their careers, will be part of your uh, personal as well as professional organizations. You want to make sure that you maintain, or networks, I should say, that you maintain connections with them. Uh, you might be able to share information about, it, including possible job opportunities that uh, somebody else may be aware of, but uh, they may already have a, a position secured. So this is a really important time to do it uh, uh, rather than after the fact, after they graduate, uh, while they're still uh, in uh, in uh, the university, to be able to develop that sense of what a professional organization, what a professional network is like, or what it's about, maybe even encouraging them to attend the annual events uh, for that organization, uh, which is really important to meet other people as well. Yeah, Dan, I, I agree with that. I think it, another thing that's really important is to encourage students, like you said, to go to their go to the conferences that these organizations often uh, set up. There's usually going to be something like since we're so close to Chicago, usually there will be something in the Chicago area. And also to per, uh, I come from a music background, so I was really encouraged to like uh, send work you know, send our work to be put in either a poster session or a, a performance, something like that. You don't always get uh, get in, but I think it's a good practice to encourage people to actually uh, try to, you know, participate, not just as a, a bystander, but actually get, get involved, maybe even volunteer to help run one of the conferences or something. I, I've done that back in my, back in the day when I was in the, uh, doing other things, but yeah. Um, let's see, somebody somebody posted something in the chat here. Let's see what we got. Mike, this is Dan again. I, I was reading Dawn's response to, uh, for language students interested in majoring or minoring. She recommended the uh, foreign language resist, uh, residence program, FLIRP. My son actually had a Japanese minor and he was part of that, that organization. He was doing something with them every day, and at the end of the year, they'd have a, a, a big event where they would invite family members to it. It was, uh, you know, people were, were bringing food in uh, to share with us. It was a wonderful, it was an opportunity for people to showcase their, their language in skits uh, and songs. Um, so, Don, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is a, a real kick, man. I, I, I thought my son enjoyed it. I know I enjoyed watching him do that. Yeah. Great. And uh, thanks, Alexa. I read read your comment there. Yeah, that's that's kind of how it works, you know, like letting people know about things. That's kind of really how this works. A lot of times word of mouth and, and a recommendation is all that it takes to move someone in, in that direction. So. Mike, this is Yvonne. Sure. Mm -hmm. And building upon your uh, you, you brought in the topic of experiential learning, mm -hmm. and I agree with that and have integrated experiential learning in courses and see that, I, you know, I always tell students that this is an opportunity um, for you to practice and gain skills in these tasks that you will be performing, um, maybe in graduate school or when you're working on your dissertation or in your profession, and have them work with professionals or or try out different techniques in in a a space where they'll get feedback from you know me as the professor and feedback from their colleagues in the course and i find that that definitely increases engagement in the course so so i agree with that thanks Yvonne. yeah of course that's yeah i think that's something like the university I think higher education is probably going to keep evolving in that direction. I, that's just my thought. I don't know. It's a, can be a bit expensive in 
it requires some changes in the way we view um, departments and colleges because yeah a lot of times some of the new um, exciting careers are multidisciplinary and it really requires both specialists and generalists and and but more importantly just the ability to talk to someone that has a slight you know a different background different skill set so that you can actually collaborate with that person and create something that the individuals wouldn't be able to do by themselves mm -hmm. I think hopefully building upon, you know, if we build upon what we have in place and people see success, then maybe it'll continue to increase because they're definitely valuable um, opportunities mm -hmm. to build your skill and knowledge. So um, any uh, further thoughts from our guest today? I I'd like to hear what you, if you, um, you know, like I said, anything that you, any experience you've had with connecting your students with other departments or outside of, outside of uh, the campus. I think one thing to keep in mind is like, it seems, you know, when you're a student, it seems like it, that's uh, everything, but you're really only in school maybe four years, six years, even if you do a PhD, what, eight, ten years tops. And then you've got another, you know, 30 plus 40 years of outside of the institution. So it's really just the beginning of, of your of your uh, career. And uh, so having that bridge and 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 just to see just to see that the horizon, I think, is part of what the way I, I think of engagement is to give people like these like goals that they're aiming at. So it's not just I need to pass this test, I need to pass this class, I need to, you know, and it's too short-sighted to keep keep the fire burning, keep these people progressing through college. They need to see that there's like a, a real benefit to it. Well, Don had mentioned the foreign language residence program at NIU and mm -hmm. um, I think those are interesting ways that students can engage. Um, they, what do they do, Don? Do they live on the same floor, or, or how does that work? Yeah, they. I don't know where they're currently housed. A long time ago, it was in Douglas Hall, but uh, yeah, we would we lived on the same. We had two floors at the time, actually. Um, one for participants and then the other for those that were interested they weren't totally locked in but um, yeah you live on the floor and you have unless something's changed obviously last year it didn't work out but you have dinner with your language group Monday through Thursday and you have to speak the language and then they do field trips they do outings throughout the year um, like I remember going to Taft and um, you know certain themes were presented and we did like a scavenger hunt and um, so yeah it's it's definitely a community building it's definitely built community so that's where I to this day I have friends from from Plurp so that's awesome yeah Oh, one thing, one thing I want to add too is they're, um, they bring in heritage speakers to live on the floor. So, you know, it's not like you're just spending for yourself. You're actually, you know, working with um, speakers from, from other countries. So like from, when I was there, it was Germany, Spain, um, Mexico, France, you know, things have changed somewhat, but I'm sure they still bring in other, you know, speakers. I could see where that would be very effective. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and they lived on the floor. So if you had questions about your homework or <laughs> I remember going to, you know, the Spanish speakers and, and yeah, for help. So we'd also have, I think, weekly, weekly meetings. Um, 
So there are so many ways that you would spend time with each other and in the target language. Great. Well, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, I don't know if Dan, Dan, do you have some closing thoughts for today that you prepared or are we just going to fade out? As no, I wouldn't said. let us fade out. Um, okay. I didn't have any prepared uh, statements, but I want to thank all the uh, participants today who were very actively engaged. I felt that we, in fact, were doing a lot of interacting and we were for the short time a community. Uh, and that's what uh, that's what really the purpose of, of this presentation was was really all about to develop that sense of community if not for just an hour uh for your students for the entire uh duration of, of uh, the courses that we teach and that when they are done with the course that they will have a wonderful experience in fact they might be wistful and thinking well i wish i could i could be in this community for a long a lot longer um and that's what we want we want people who are completely invested in in not just the the course content, but also with each other and with the and with the instructor, and I, I think that what we've discussed today really gives us a better sense for how we might approach that in our own course, whether that's online or face to face. I would like to uh, thank you all again and uh, wish you good luck for uh, the summer uh, session if you're teaching this summer, but also for the fall when we return to face to face for most of the classes. I'm sure you. Everyone is looking forward to that, although the online component will still remain useful for those folks who do have face-to-face uh, -face settings and to be able to use some of the tools that we talked about uh, in an online uh, uh, setting, even though you may have face-to-face -face, uh, setting. Well, thank you so much. I want to wish you all well. Um, thank you, Alexa, Bill, Don, Nahal, uh, and Robert. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great summer. Feel free to contact our department if you have any questions. Uh, if you want to try out some of these tools, we're more than happy to help.